yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hello and welcome to Jen Taylor Rerouting. Where being rude is never acceptable, but sarcasm is welcome and swearing isn't always a bad option. Let's get started. Welcome to Jen Taylor Rerouting. I'm very happy, excited to have Anna Lundberg on today. Anna, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Jen. And people are going to notice immediately that compared to me, you have an accent. Or maybe compared to you, I have an accent. One of, the, <laughs> one of us has an accent. Tell me where you are. Yeah, I'm in London. So actually, I'm born and raised in London, but actually my parents are Swedish, just to add a bit of a complicated twist. So there you go. So I speak both English and uh, Swedish, UK English and Swedish. <laughs> UK English. It's good that you uh, pointed that out because it's not the same as American English, is it? It's not. But, no. uh, you know, we still understand each other. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> it's all good. Tell me about what you do now. You have a website. It's very, I, what I love when I go to your website is how easy it is to, in, to interact with it. It's very oh, easy. It's called onestepoutside.com. Tell me about that. Yeah, so One Step Outside comes from the quote, or there are different versions of it, but something along the lines of everything you've ever wanted is one step outside your comfort zone. So that's where the inspiration came from. Um, but I really love it because there's the getting out of your comfort zone, growing, challenging yourself element of it, but there's also the one step. So you don't have to take massive leaps always. It can also be sort of that gradual transformation. Um, so I, well, it's a big umbrella really, but I help people at the moment in particular, I'm focusing on people who are stuck in the corporate nine to five, breaking free of that and bringing more freedom, creativity, fun, flexibility, fulfillment, all those fantastic words, um, and to build a business and a lifestyle that brings those things and allows you to dream big, have those amazing audacious goals and, and do amazing things, but not sacrifice your personal relationships and health and so on to do so so it's a lot around balance and um, you know self-care self-compassion and so on while doing all these fun and exciting things and it is overwhelming isn't it taking uh, it was for me when i started two years ago it was absolutely you it's exciting and you want to do it and you have these big goals but you're right you have to you have to break it down you can't eat an elephant in one bite no exactly it's so long we wish we could but especially yeah. because often you know career transition comes along with divorce and wanting to lose weight and wanting to meet someone etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know it is not just oh i want to change career or change a job but it tends to come in a package which makes it addition, you know really all the more challenging is that a surprise for people? Because it was for me. I hired a coach and I was trying to figure out just, you know, starting a, getting the website up and like the logistical things, the things on the back end that you, isn't even what you do. And I realized I was getting rid of relationships. And even in my own relationship with my husband, you know, we, everything came to a screeching halt and we had to, we it was a, it was like the best thing that ever happened, but there was a point where we were like, yeah, I don't know if I like you enough to stick it out. <laughs> and then we, we were like, no, I definitely like you enough to stick it out, but we need to do that with some changes. Your metamorphosis kind of is really in every area of your life. And I did not expect that. So how do people mm. handle that transition? Oh, well, so many things to say there. I mean, metamorphosis, since you use that word, I love, I discovered relatively recently that that transformation of the butterfly, you know, you see the hungry caterpillar, whatever, it's like a little caterpillar goes to sleep, ta-da, wakes up as a butterfly. The actual science behind it, and I'm going to, you know, botch it, I don't know the <laughs> exact details, I'm not a biologist. However, it is incredibly painful, takes a lot of time. The caterpillar like dis dissolves into protein soup, and then has to kind of rebuild itself. And I think that's quite a good metaphor because we've always thought of, oh yes, I'm going to transform to this beautiful butterfly, but it's painful, it's messy and so on. And as you said, it's, it's not just one area. That has repercussions on everything else because um, your identity and our identity in the West, I think in particular, is so tied up with who we are career-wise. So if you begin to question um, your job, what you're doing, your vision, your purpose in life, that has definitely re repercussions on your partner. He might or she might begin to question, okay, what role do I have here? They might question their own um, career choices and so on. And then everybody around you, your entire circle who know Anna in a certain you know, role and identity, suddenly you're breaking all those rules and, and uh, messing things up. So I think that's you know, pretty terrifying for you, but also the people around you. 
It's true. It was really, um, I, we're minimalists. And when you think about being a minimalist with your physical possessions, you can make sense. Okay. Get rid of 80% of what's in your closet. Cause you're not wearing it. Okay. Even if you can't imagine doing that, you can visualize removing a physical product, but it, when it's emotional metamorphosis, it's a little bit different. It's not tangible. So I imagine it's very difficult for people. And I know like with the butterfly example, I'm not a scientist either, so I will probably <laughs> watch this. But you know when they're coming out of the cocoon and they're butterflies, but they're coming out of the co cocoon, well, we want to help them. So you can like help open up the cocoon. And what happens is that painful process of coming through the co cocoon is what's forcing the blood from their body into their wings. And when we help them, we stop that from happening and oh, then they wow. can fly. Yeah. And so, you know what? You got to go through it, basically. You mm. need to go through. You can have help in some ways, but the stuff that's really painful, you just have to get through or your wings aren't even going to work. And oh, I love that. I'm going to add that to my little <laughs> metaphor. <Yay. laughs> <laughs> so you, now let's go back. You grew up in London. Did you spend a lot of time in Sweden? Yes, always. All my grandparents are there. My, yeah, both of my parents are Swedish. So, you know, grew up with a very Swedish culture at home and spent all our summers there and Christmas and everything. So How, how different are the two? Oh, I mean, not so different. I mean, it's Northern Europe, isn't it? But, and, you know, everyone in Sweden kind of watches English TV and so on. And, and it's such a short flight apart. So it's pretty united. But of course, pe when people ask me, you know, do I feel more Swedish or English? I always notice the differences. So when I'm in Sweden, I feel more English, British because that's the difference that I see. And when I'm in the UK, I feel myself being more Swedish just because I notice how I'm different to everyone around me. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, so opposite it's of crazy, I mean. but it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not crazy different, but you know, I definitely notice the differences. So take me back to growing up otherwise. I know in our email, you said, um, you you had good girl syndrome and in your story I was like I'm gonna punch that teacher <laughs> so I wanted to like scoop you up and hug you and go all mama bear on you but uh, tell tell me about that because that would be mortifying if you're that sweet kid that's just really trying to do the right thing and especially if you're shy a little bit also so mm. tell us about kind of your experience growing up yeah, well, I have lots of little stories like that, memories, and I'm not sure some of them I think probably my mum told me, some of them I, I remember more sort of painfully in my heart, I guess. Um, but I do have, you know, some pictures of that little girl, and I just feel like there was this skipping, happy little girl, and not to over-dramatise, but I do feel that spirit was squeezed out of her a little bit and just gradually, you know, being told, especially in a strict British school system, to sit properly and not fiddle with stuff, and not be too creative, and not, you know, I don't know, um, be too messy, you have to get it right the first time, all these comments that you get from the teachers, the big red pen, the gold star when you do well, and so on, so I think that experience, when I look back now, completely shaped who I was, and it was only, you know, in the last five, six years that I've broken free of that and actually had the confidence to go out there and define or find the right answer for myself I think I was constantly looking outside for someone to tell me oh what university should I go to and what's the right subject and what's the right career and what's the right relationship and so on and that answer doesn't exist and if it does certainly there isn't someone else who can tell me what that answer is so that's been sort of a long long journey that's taken me 30 years I suppose to <laughs> to discover well, and as a little kid in school, when, and you said you'd get really embarrassed. Did you not like attention drawn to you or was it just the getting in trouble that bothered you? Oh, well, that's so interesting. So I hated getting in trouble. I mean, still now, if someone tells me off, my face goes purple. <laughs> but I also once remember my teacher who I won't name, but I didn't love her. She was <laughs> quite um, evil, but she made me stand on my chair once um, because I got 99 out of 100 on my French test. So I've had to stand on my chair once when I was informed to when I was five years old and I broke my ruler and then I was told off and then another time I was told to stand on my chair so in both cases completely mortified embarrassed in front of everyone so neither the experience of you know doing something wrong or doing something right was particularly enjoyable throughout that school I felt like you couldn't quite win there and of course well of course I say of course but certainly going into secondary school you know I, I did quite well I didn't study I studied less and less to compensate for the fact that I was teased for being smart and for being a goody not a goody two shows what I don't even know how to call it anymore. what do you say like a geeky I suppose you'd say now and um, you know I studied loads and I didn't so I'd study less and less until at the point I got um, a grade on my um, school card that gave me top marks for achievement and bottom for effort 
which I think is actually pretty good, <laughs> but it's not awesome. good. Really. I, mean, I, I mean, I kind of want to high five you, and I kind of want to smack you, you know? <laughs> exactly. As a parent, not so good, right? And it's such a missed right. potential. And then actually, uh-huh. when I was 15, I changed to an American school where certainly, and I don't know if this is true in all of America, but certainly in that school, it was admired to be smart and good. And, and that kind of really encouraged me and, and people... Yeah, people were supportive and um, yeah, it was a much better thing to be smart and talented and good at different things. And that kind of gave me a bit of kick out the backside to, um, to get back into it and actually <laughs> do a bit better at school as well. That's so sad how much, I mean, we, we need to realize the impact we have on people every single day, especially kids, when you, you could get excellent grades with no effort and you were made fun of being smart. I mean, that, you know, that kills me or that creativity is being stifled or personality. Um, so when it's rigid like that, no, I would say American schools overall, it's not the cool thing to be the smart kid, mm. but you have to, I, I also think you have to understand that kids aren't particularly the most polite or nice when they're growing up, you're figuring yourself out and you're, f- you know, you're picking on everyone else. Some people are, but I'm glad your experience was that it was rewarded. Um, and you were in a much more strict situation. So how awful. So no wonder, no wonder you're just like, I want to, I just don't want to be, have to stand on the chair. I don't want to stand on the chair. And no, and I was teased. I was teased for being smart. I was teased for being young and I was teased being Swedish. Um, you know, because actually we were saying how different is it? Not very, but I was in the Surrey where I've I've grown up sort of Southeast of England. Um, there weren't, there wasn't a lot of ethnic diversity. You know, I look the same as everyone around me, but even that was enough of a difference to be sort of pointed at a little bit. But I think, as you say, we don't have that emotional intelligence when we're younger, anyone who's the tiniest bit different, and I wasn't the only one. And funnily enough, I suppose funny, um, now in later years, I've talked to a couple of the girls who were, to my mind, bullying me, even though I guess I now recognize that they didn't know what they were doing and so on. They have no idea. They think we're the best of friends and have no idea that they traumatized me for all those years. So, you know, as an adult, you can kind of empathize and understand that they had things going on and they didn't realize and so on. But as a child, and I can't even imagine as a parent how protective I'd want to be of, of protecting my children from not going through that as well. Yeah, you do. You definitely do. Because as, as an adult, you remember what it feels like as a child. And then as a mom, you don't want your Mm. kids to ever feel that way. And you can't take it away. And it's, it's a very helpless, uh, vulnerable feeling, I'd say, to watch your kids go through something that you know was painful for you yourself. So yeah, and you, and you kind of can't. And it's almost, it's worse when your kids are the ones that aren't being very nice. True. I mean, that's actually worse for me as a mom. If I have a kiddo who's not being nice, that makes me furious mm. because I know the impact that they're having on that other child without even, like you said, without even really, they think you're the best of friends <laughs> without even realizing it, you know, they're making a, uh, they can really traumatize someone. So. Yeah. But there are also kids who, and I'm, I really admire them. I see them now and I saw them then who are so, I don't know if it's confidence, but they're grounded and, and kudos to their parents. I don't know what they've done, but somehow they're able for it just to wash off. They're like, oh, well, you know, this is me. I like this. You don't. Fair enough. No problem. And they get on with their stuff. And I just wish I'd had that. And I think I have that now. This is what I was saying. I've finally got to that point when I can be like, you know what? Some people like it. Some people won't. It's fine. I'm doing my thing. Um, but I so admire kids who are like that. I, I, I would love to understand what it is about yeah, their, their upbringing, their personality that lets them be so grounded and so sound, really, in, even in the face of all that um, turbulence and stuff going on around them. I think as a parent, you, well, and you as a coach, it's the same, it will be the exact same situation. When those, when those issues come up, or you're feeling that way, or that situation happens, you instantly say, well, it's okay for them to feel that way. Mm-hmm. And it's okay for you to be different. And who do you want to be? And, and when we, when we let society's pressures, those outside pressures impact us, then we aren't our genuine self. So if you like me, well, do you really like me? Because you really don't know me because I'm not my genuine self. And so I think with my kids, I kept telling them, you don't want artificial relationships. And there's no way you're not going to get artificial relationships if you're not genuinely yourself. And so because everyone's different and you're going to get made fun of it no matter what, just embrace it with a fury. 
That's so true. And and you say relationships. I mean, I, that's something I just discovered, I guess, came to realise in, in terms of romantic relationships. I realised what's the point of playing cool and being a certain way? If you're going to live with this person, they will eventually find out or you're going to have to play this role the rest of your life. And suddenly that was so empowering to me. I was like, oh, I get it. I should be myself because then I'll attract someone who likes me for who I am. And then that will make a really stable and, and uh, true relationship, which I now have, which is very nice. So, you know, it's it's a funny one. Um, it also makes me think of, do you know Bronnie Ware, the Australian Australian nurse who wrote um, the top five regrets of the dying. Oh yes. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. So the, she was um, um, working in palliative care, uh, people end of life um, and sort of collected together the lessons she learned or, or they said they had learned during their long lives. And the number one was, I wish I'd let myself live a life that was true to myself and not live up to other people's expectations. And I think that's so powerful and it might be difficult to go back and tell ourselves as children that, but certainly we can try to embrace that now ourselves and hopefully um, impart that wisdom to our kids as well so they can understand as you said how important that is I love that I also think kids are learning who they are and so some of that is trial and error mm -hmm. and so you know my um, eight-year-old daughter when she was six she just said I said do you want to take dance lessons and she said I just need a stage and some music because everyone thinks I'm cute and I was like oh Oh, if only it were that easy. <laughs> she said, I just need a YouTube channel, you know, and oh, wow. where, that, where you don't want to stifle that confidence at the same time, you need to be realistic. And, mm. you know, you want to be either a brain surgeon or an astronaut or a fireman. Like they're yeah. all lateral and they're very much not. And so I think a lot of being a kid and even especially a teenager is that you're learning. You don't really know who you are. So some of that is a lot of trial and error and stumbling you don't just need music in a stage and everybody will think you're cute. So it does not <laughs> work that way. <laughs> Darn it. So you tell me about school and university and your degree and your corporate. Let's, let's focus on a little bit of that where you went in that direction. Oh, sure. So I, um, yeah, so I went to the normal sort of school path in England and my sister was two years older. So they always called me by her name. You know, they always thought I was <laughs> a classic younger sister syndrome there as well. Um, but when I broke free a little bit was when I was 15. So in the UK, you do exams when you're 15, 16, and then again, 17, 18. And instead of doing the A-levels, which is what we do in the UK, I changed to this American school. And that for me, as I said, sort of opened up. It was um, I did the International Baccalaureate at the IB, so it was quite yeah. a broad, a bit like the AP that you guys have, you know, sort of broad range of subjects. Um, I got involved in the theatre group. Um, sports were a little bit different, difficult because they were all different to what I'd done. We'd play netball, they played basketball. Like I couldn't quite, I did some cheerleading. I didn't really get good at anything, but I did a little bit of everything. Um, and then I took a year out. Um, which is good because you say astronaut there. I was very close to not becoming an astronaut, but I, I was applying to astrophysics and medicine. Um, so I was all over the place, even at that age, 17, 18. And luckily I took a gap year. And then I went to Oxford University where I studied PPE, which is philosophy, politics and economics. And again, the reason for choosing that was the breadth of subjects. Because I was, I, there's a German word, word um, Torschluss Panik, which is the panic or the fear of closed doors, <laughs> closing doors. And I think that's what I had. I just wanted to keep all my options open. Um, and I just, you know, kept choosing these really broad um, degrees and things so I could um, keep that breadth and I just not make a decision as to what I was going to do career-wise. Um, and after that, after um, the undergraduate, I didn't really know what to do. And I think my mum's colleague recommended or mentioned this postgraduate in Geneva in Switzerland. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. Um, and so up until, what was that? I didn't even know how old I was there, but you know, master's postgraduate level, I just kind of had my blinders on a little bit and I was just following the conveyor belt of people saying, oh, you shouldn't study that because you won't earn any money doing that, or, oh, this is better, or that's not. And I was like, oh, okay, fine, okay. <laughs> I didn't have that sort of strong passion that was pulling me in a certain direction. Um, and then after that, too, I wanted, at that point, I decided I wanted to work at the UN or in development. I had studied politics and economics and law and so on, and um, did lots of internships in NGOs in the UN. And then I ended up working at a big multinational consumer packaged goods company. And um, so I got sort of sucked into the private sector, doing something completely different from what I thought I wanted. So that was sort of the next step on the conveyor belt. Um, but also the next step of not really thinking about what I wanted and making a choice that maybe wasn't quite aligned with, um, you know, what I really wanted to do. That's so hard when you don't. I always tell my kids, if you want to take a year off, that's fine. And get a general education uh, associate's degree in the U.S. is the first mm. two-year degree. Because 
and take every class that you're interested in because you don't know if you're interested if you've never exposed yourself to it. However, <laughs> with you, you did that. You did exactly that and still didn't feel like you were finding your niche. Kind of. I kind of did that, but I mean, the liberal arts kind of concept, I really wanted to go to an American university and do that. As you say, I think doing a couple of years abroad, and as you said, with children, that curiosity learning and so on, I think that's so important. And when we're 17, 18, we're still children. Somebody said the other day that our brains aren't mature until 25. So, you know, I think we're, we're not necessarily making the right choices, whatever that means for ourselves at that age. And um, so I do think having that breadth of, of trying things and, and maintaining the maths and sciences and stuff while we're also doing humanities, I think would stand us all in much better stead for whatever careers we eventually do end up in. And I think there's a lot of pressure to pick what you like that you want to do for the rest of your life. And that's how daunting is that? How could you possibly know that at 18? Because then you go from, you could be super smart and interested in a lot, but you haven't lived a life experience mm. to really let you know where you, where you feel like you fit the most. That's, and that's such a, well, it's a fun transition for kids in that age when they're learning that, exploring that. But then you have where we all end up at some point where I, completely started a new business two years ago and I'm 47. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at 45, I was like, well, I'm done. I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. And that's, so how did you find your niche for the coaching that you do? Cause you kind of took every personal experience of your own and, and built this business around that. Can you go in? Yeah, and it all makes perfect sense now, doesn't it? As Steve yes. Jobs said, if you connect the dots looking back. Yeah. Something that's funny in the UK as well is that, you know, you hardly ever do end up in the career that you study. And I think that is a difference with Sweden because in Sweden, people always ask me, what are you going to be? Like, are you going to be qualified engineer? Are you going to be a nurse? Like, they couldn't quite understand this idea of just studying some academic subject. In the UK, almost all my friends studied chemistry or geography, biology, and they almost all end up in banking or finance or consulting or something, right? Which I think is such a shame as well. So all the more reason as you said to study something that you're interested in so if I had studied English or somebody studied Arcananth which is archaeology and anthropology which I just found fascinating but wow if I'd known that existed <laughs> I would have loved to have done that so you know um, but in any case, um, I guess it's a long story too, because I, so I was seven years in that private company working on marketing. And the reason I chose marketing was because in the UN, I had been in the communications department. So I'd worked on sort of a project with um, a great project, actually a music CD with lots of sort of famous African artists around the Millennium Development Goals. And we'd done press releases and so on. I thought, okay, if I don't get a role within the UN, maybe I can get into the private sector, get lots of experience and then come back and save the world kind of thing was my plan um, but throughout those seven years and I always have to um, caveat all this with the fact that I loved my time in this company you know I've made friends for life I learned so much so many of the doors that have opened since then are all because of that experience and I had a great time so I wasn't one of the people who hated my jobs and the people around me and so on so that also is maybe why it was so hard for me to break free from that because it was really nice I liked it um, but I was there seven years and I still don't know exactly what led to this but I asked for a sabbatical so I took three months to travel across South America. And then because I got out of my comfort zone and that bubble and away from people, and because I met all these amazing people and, um, you know, I read stuff, I, I listened to, I don't know if they're podcasts then, but certainly blogs and all sorts. Um, and I sort of got up the courage somehow to quit my job because I allowed myself to dream that, oh, I can be a writer or I can work at the UN again and I can do all these things. And um, so I quit without really having a plan. And that was 2013. Um, so that's sort of when it started and it started by doing very similar things to what I'd been doing in that job so I was doing consulting contracts and then traveling in between those then the pendulum swung to my hippie phase as I call it which is when I sort of discovered coaching and I wasn't earning a lot of money but I was traveling the world and I turned my back on all of that business and marketing experience and now the last year or so I found this magical blend of using the two and um, so recognizing that I have these 10 years of experience in business and strategy marketing branding and so on um, and also being able to use all these new passions that I found and combine those two together so I'm sure it'll evolve again in the next few years as it does but um, for now at least I'm really happy with that balance of um, all these different things both yeah, anchored in what I've done before um, but fun ways of using that not uh, <laughs> not necessarily the sort of negative side of that corporate experience but taking all the good bits I guess and then adding the good bits of coaching and speaking and writing all those things on top have you realized that those of us who start businesses have no idea how to market and brand? 
<laughs> well, there's two things. So I actually do know how to market and brand me personally, but even right. as a branding and marketing person, I first of all need someone else's help, right? Because you don't see your own experience or your own business. And the second thing is I actually realized I didn't do sales because we, I thought, oh yeah, marketing brand, I can sell. I said, no, no, <laughs> it's a very different thing to get someone on the phone and actually sell them your services. And in particular, you know, in a full-time job, I certainly never asked for a salary increase. I never had to sell myself in that sense, my worth. I just kind of did my job and people tell me I was good or not, you know, and it's a very different thing when you're suddenly the business owner and you have to pitch people and convert your clients and all these things. So that was quite scary for me. Um, but definitely, as you said, there are lots of people as well who are amazing at what they do, their craft, and um, whether they're a yoga instructor or an accountant or whatever it is, but don't necessarily have that business marketing savvy. And you're very, you're so correct because I write, but writing your landing page to your website, which is your mm -hmm. brand, you know, who are, that is almost impossible to write your own. I mean, I think basically a hundred percent of the time someone else should write that for you because you'll be surprised at what they see compared to what you mm. see. And it's, it's really hard to think of yourself in the third person and be objective and unbiased and yeah. We, I, I don't, I have no clue how to do that stuff. So I think that that's pretty common. And so you are taking people who are doing the nine to five and work in corporate. And like you said, I love that you pointed out you were not unhappy with your job. Mm -hmm. You really loved your job. And so it's not just that part. It's just moving into a different. It would be really hard to love it and and still move on. Yeah, I think, I mean, there were, for me, there was a disconnect because I thought I wanted to be over here doing this one thing and I was over there doing something else. And I think those two worlds are so disconnected. So I always think that it, I, I never want to persuade someone to quit their job. That's not my thing. That's not why I'm here. Um, I just want you to think about really with great intentionality and deep down feel and really think through all the options. Is this where you want to be? Because if so then you let go of all the, oh, if only I could, da, 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 and you live in this and you make the most of that and you enjoy it and you try to find time to be with your family and so on within those existing parameters. And that's incredibly freeing and empowering and amazing. However, <laughs> if you are there and you're constantly looking out the window, wishing, you know, the grass is always greener, that kind of thing, then I want to kind of grab you and shake you and be like, look, this is totally possible. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. Um, but, you know, please don't give up. Don't be one of those people who regrets not having lived their fullest life like that top progress of the dying. And don't put your PowerPoint presentations and meetings ahead of your children's birthdays and your partner's, you know, whatever it is. I just think it's such a shame that we dedicate so much of our time and energy and health um, to these jobs that fundamentally aren't usually making a difference in the world you know in that greater sense I think and, and certainly lack some meaning for our, ourselves I think so I do those are the people I want to to um, inspire and um, help them imagine what is possible and then go out there and do that and it's okay to like where you're at but know it's not for you for the long term and have no clue what is for you for the wrong term long term so how do you work if there's a client that comes to you and says yeah I'm not unhappy but well for you uh, let me jump in and correct me if I'm wrong you wanted to travel yeah so I had a few different things I mean I had still kind of that UN idea in the back of my head which I don't think was right for me but you know I still had that I always wanted to be a writer whatever that means so I had the idea that I would go to some island and write um, and yeah I wanted to travel more as well so I also from a personal situation um, I woke up one morning and all my friends around me had either left Switzerland because it's a very expat place or they'd moved to the suburbs married and popped out two children and I didn't get that memo so suddenly I was in the nightclub there by myself looking around everyone's like 10 years younger than me I'm thinking hang on what happened here so for me personally as well it was also a good time to you know Geneva is a lovely place quality of life amazing but it's very quiet um, small beautiful place to raise a family um, but I think it was time for me to move on to sort of get out of my personal comfort zone as well yeah, you don't want to be a cougar at the nightclub. Well, there are some attractive guys there, I have to say. <laughs> they, they seemed a bit reluctant. <laughs> so 
is the first step, well, once you've recognized, a lot of people love their jobs or even don't love their jobs, but they don't necessarily want to change. So the first thing is recognizing that you're a person who is unsettled. Is that a good word? It's not that you're unhappy, but you feel like something's off or missing or the things like travel or family that are the most important to you don't align with the job that you're doing in a way that's the most beneficial. So it's once you've recognized that, then they would reach out to you. Yeah. And I think that's a great first place to start. I think it is understanding, making that decision do I stay or do I go? Basically, it's that simple red pill, blue pill kind of thing. And I think we often get caught up in all the different possibilities and we start to um, explain why this couldn't work and that couldn't work and I could never do that and so on before we've even made that decision. So the how can follow. Some things may be possible, some not, but we're not even there yet. What we're trying to get to is, you know, do you want to change? Once you've decided that, then we can look at, okay, what would you like to change to? what could be possible and how do you get there? So definitely, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think how to, I mean, I have somewhere some old resource that I have sort of seven signs that, you know, it's time to rethink your career. One of them is actually everything is fine because fine is not how I necessarily want to live my life, right? You might get into that comfort zone, but if everything is like, okay, you know, just a bit, meh, that's probably enough of a reason to think, hang on, I'd like to change. Or if you're, you know, counting the hours until the end of the day, counting the days until the weekend, counting the weeks until the holiday, that's probably not a good sign either. Um, you know, I, I do, you know, burnout is something I've talked to so many people about that it's really hard to catch before it happens. But I think we just have to, if we're feeling drained, in my case, I get migraines when I push myself too much. You know, we each have, some people get stomach problems and so on. I think when we're sacrificing our health, for our work, that's another sign that you need to change. But understanding, yeah, do we want to change? And maybe what are the motivations for that as well? Is it something that could be solved by, you know, maybe just taking a bit of a sabbatical, maybe that is enough, or changing your role or going down to four days a week or um, whatever it is. So there are, you know, you don't have to necessarily quit. Um, but I think that's first decision of, am I happy where I am is absolutely the first place to start. I totally agree, completely agree. And I lost my job two years ago and funding ran out. And I would have told you every single day how much I, I loved my job. And when it ended, I couldn't believe how much relief I felt. Oh, wow. So somewhere in there, I was lying to myself. But um, I think I could have stayed had I made those little changes within it, but mm -hmm. you have to, you really have to recognize it. You're right. Your family, your health, emotionally, your triggers, like you said, migraines, you know, mine is I don't sleep well. Mm. I'll have weird dreams that don't make any sense. And I know, okay, if this is happening for a few nights, I need to just take a step back. But you have to really recognize that because if you think if all you're posting on your social media is, I hate that it's Monday and thank God it's Friday. <laughs> why? Why? Do you know what, just to say, it's so funny that you say that because literally today, you know how Facebook gives you, you know, three years ago, five years ago, yeah. six years ago, Anna, you posted, oh, I have that Monday feeling with this like sad crying face. And I was like sharing that today going, oh my gosh, look, this is six years ago. That was me. This is me today. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and it was such like a stark emoji difference of how I was feeling because now I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Monday. I'm so excited. I'm talking to Jen. I'm going to write this. Uh, yeah. So that's such a funny, um, funny juxtaposition of the two worlds. It, it is, it, but what a juxtaposition. I mean, it's so, it's so glaring to me and, and I don't know what it's like in London as opposed to here, but um, people are very, very negative. And it's so easy. It's so easy to be irritated at the guy at the mm -hmm. coffee shop who messes up your order, but it's not as easy when they don't mess up your order to be like, dude, high five me. You made my morning. This was great. I love your energy. You know, I mean, we, we take a lot of time to put energy into negativity. We don't take a lot of time to put negative, uh, put energy into positivity, which leads me to what I wanted to talk to you next. And that's self-care. Mm. So you mentioned sometimes it's not the job that's not right for you. Sometimes you just need a break. And that's where I think self-care comes. And I think we're terrible at it. So go into how you, your thoughts and feelings on that. Cause I know you've brought it up. Yeah, well, because from a personal perspective, it's something that's really um, doesn't come naturally. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, as whatever you want to call it, the alpha personality, high achiever, good girl, all these different things, ambitious, driven, blah, 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 kind of words. Um, it's not something that you think is important. Um, and 
And as you say, unfortunately, in that situation, you either push yourself until there's a restructuring or something and you're let go in the organization, you know, you're, you're made redundant or something, or you break down physically and mentally, which has happened to a lot of people too. And unfortunately, it is hard to identify that yourself. But I think, again, the little steps of prioritizing. And if you fast forward to, let's say, you are running your own business as we are, I saw a quote on Instagram. It's so good to have inspirational quotes, isn't it? It's such an <laughs> important part of living your life. Um, but it was something along the lines of, you know, when you run your own business, or you are your own business, self care, uh, taking care of yourself is taking care of your business. Because um, if you're running yourself into the ground, even more so when you have your own business, although it also applies when you're in a job, um, you know, you're not going to be able to succeed you're not going to be able to take care of your family who usually are trying to take care of by working so hard and so on and um, again another metaphor the oxygen mask which i'm sure yes you've heard i was going to use that yep put it on yourself before yep. you help anyone else because if you go back to the people who are before they've been made redundant or burned out or quit their job or whatever they'll say no, no no you don't understand i have to take care of my kids the mortgage and so on it's like okay but do you think you're serving your family by being miserable by sitting with what used to be your BlackBerry, probably now as an iPhone or some more modern equipment, um, you know, taking your computer on holiday with you, being grumpy, um, drinking with your mates after work because you can't quite face going home because you need to kind of get out that aggravation from work or whatever. That's not serving your family. So I think that's a bit misguided. We think that we are doing the right thing and that's some, some kind of self-righteous excuse I guess lie you said you were lying to yourself in some way I think it's not conscious obviously but I think there's a kind of deception going on there um unfortunately so it's hard to say what to do with that I think and certainly my role as a coach I would never come in at that point and persuade someone that they need to do something they need to come to that themselves so hopefully yeah. if if you know they read something I've written or they watch a video of something will spark it and will gradually maybe they go on a trip maybe they chat to someone those are certainly for me the little triggers here and there that gradually got me to a place where I was ready to take action um but it is hard when you're so deep into that you just can't can't see that so um I guess in those um, situations as you said putting self-care first irrespective of career and all this other stuff starting your own business working with a coach just see how can you get more sleep how can you take more breaks um whether it's a holiday or a day or a weekend whatever it is but just find a way to feel better because everything else will be so much easier um, if you if you feel well and happy to begin with and it's a bit like you know the maslow's um, hierarchy of needs you have to have that basic sort of security, physical health and so on in order to strive for the amazing self-actualization stuff at the top of the pyramid. You can't do that if you're falling to pieces physically. You know, I can't when I have a migraine go, oh, I wonder how I shall create freedom and fulfillment in my life today. That's just not on the agenda. I'm like, put me in a dark room with, you know, the lights off um, with a glass of water and that's as far as I can get really. So And it's sad that it takes us a lot of the times that much or something happening. I I remember 12 or 12 or 13 years ago, I was working in a dental office and there were seven women and we were doing a secret Santa and um, we had to fill out one paper that said, you know, if it was all this do little things for this person between Thanksgiving and Christmas to make them feel good. And so it was, it was information about yourself, like your favorite candy bar, or your favorite drink, or what are your favorite smells or colors so that your favorite flower. And I had to take it home and think about it. And right then I realized that I should never mm. have to think about those things. So it was one of those things, you know, I had been a stay at home mom for over a decade and I went back into the workforce. And for me, finding that balance, it's easy to put yourself on the back burner and take care of the kids and the job. And, the, and when I, I had to fill out this paper, I still have it in my journal. It fell out and um, Dane picked it up and he opened it and he said, were you, was this from speed dating? <laughs> so I, it was not, um, but I guess they, it's the same information for speed dating, like all this little information that we should be able to just list it off quickly. Mm. If you said to me, what's your favorite thing? Matcha tea. You know, what, what, if I could get you something little, what would it be? Bubble bath. I should be able to tell you that instantly because you know yourself. Mm. And when you have to take that paper home and fill it out, you don't know yourself. So I always tell people with self-care, fill out a secret Santa form online. Any of those where you oh, have what to a great tip. <laughs> Because if you have a hard time filling it out, you are not, you are, and, and nine out of 10 times, you're not taking care of yourself well enough. Mm. 
but if you can't tell me what I could spend five dollars on for you and give me five things that I could do that with you you are not taking care of yourself so I still have that paper 12 or 13 Aww. years later it's a reminder that you should never let that go you should such never a good reminder yeah if you don't even create the space to even for such little things let alone again the big things of what you want in life right which a lot of us don't take the time to think about right and when you get there you really need to take care of yourself i mm. mean really you have to and it's the same when you i mean do you have clients that come to you and they make this change and they really figure it's hard sometimes it's scary and difficult to figure out what who am i and what am i really passionate about mm -hmm. do you have difficulty with that step well, yes and no. I mean, what's interesting, and I, for the first time launched a group program this year, so I've seen this a bit more starkly. I'm always, I fall back on a little bit, probably a bit of mindset on my side, fall back on the career stuff, the business marketing, because that's where I have the hard expertise. And that's why people come to me, I think, because they, they feel, and as we start the conversation with, you know, you think you need to change career. You don't think, oh, I need to reimagine success and balance things across my life. Perspective. I thought, however, <laughs> most of the people who were attracted to the group program were actually less interested in the business part and more interested in exactly that in rebalancing the different areas in their lives in really working out who am i what's important to me overcoming those limiting beliefs and fears and so on so i'm really excited that's something i've just discovered now but it gives me sort of it reassures me that there's this huge area that is actually something that people are explicitly considering and hopefully something that i can build on more but of course yes it is difficult we're asking incredibly hard questions yeah. um, and you know vision and what you want from life is the first module but i have people we're now starting the fourth module and they're going back to the first module because it's something that of course you're going to have to revisit during the program many times after the program for the rest of your life right i mean i'm constantly yes. revisiting mine as well so it is a big piece but it certainly gets easier as you said with the secret santa i think the first time someone asks you who are you what do you want you're like ah no idea yeah. but once you've worked on it a few months and years you know you actually begin to also get very close to what your ideal life is which is incredibly exciting and then i find yeah. it hard to answer that question simply because i feel like i'm almost living what that is so i don't have these massive dreams anymore which sounds sounds sad maybe but i think it's good it just means i'm living in alignment with what i want to do and that is exciting. That's, that's amazing. So I love the, um, I love to journal anyway, but I journal more in a, like a, a vision. We used to do the cut out the magazines and do your mm -hmm. vision board, you know, <laughs> now we have Pinterest, so we don't yes, need to. I do it online too. <laughs> hey, I, I have a private one that nobody, and it's all my secret stuff, but it's basically the same thing, you know, what what do you love what do you want to do if you want to travel more or again you know i i got advice i don't even think it was intentionally advice but someone said to me do you ever look back in your life at things that you are wistful about mm. that and i was like yes i do well what are those things that you are wistful that you have these and I took a photography class in high school where we developed our own film. And it was one of the mm -hmm. favorite things I ever did. So if you look back on those things, well, clearly we're not developing our own film anymore. That just aged <laughs> me. <laughs> but those things that you once had passion for or that you look back and you still are drawn to, that you're wistful about, what, what are those? That was the most fun list I ever made. Oh, I love it. Do you know, d during my sabbatical, I watched the film with Jack um, Nicholson and um, Morgan Freeman, The Bucket List. And that was oh, the first yeah. time I wrote a bucket list of 100 things to do before my diet. And I, and I think it's still one of the top most visited blog posts, even though it has nothing really to do with what I do now. But it's just yeah. a fun thing to do, isn't it? But in a way, again, I've kind of grown out of that list because at the time, that was something that gave me something, you know, goals, and it made me do stuff that I wouldn't usually do. Now I do that kind of thing all the time. Anyway, it's sort of part of what I want to do. Um, the photography is interesting. So I just recently, um, I always loved sailing. My dad used to take us when we were little. And I did a course, I think when I was about 21, but that was a long time ago. Um, and it's been one of those things, I really want to do sailing. And I did nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, I was like, I had this magical week in my calendar where there was no job, like no work that needed to be done. There was just kind of this week that kind of was calling out to me. And one day I sat down, I Googled, I found a sailing course that week. Um, and I went down and had this course. And now, you know, the feeling when I was there that, oh my gosh, I've wanted to do this for so long. Um, someone asked me, why on earth are you doing that? precisely now when you're so busy I'm like well that's the reason because the whole point of what I'm doing right now my business my life choices is that I want to be able to do that kind of thing so my goodness if I can't even do that why do I even bother 
with my business, right? And hardly any emails came in that week. Nobody died. It was all, you know, somehow the world survived even when I didn't have my laptop. And now I'm going to sign up to another course in September. I'm doing a the theory. I'm going to do the next level and so on. But it's, it's such an exciting thing. And that's, you know, made possible by my career choices. But again, it's a different area of my life and, and something that just brings you so much more in alignment. It's so soul destroying to want to do something, to have that wistfulness yearning and not do anything about it. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. Soul um, destroying. That's yeah. Funny. Yeah, it is. And I don't know why we don't, except that it's easier not to. I mean, really, I understand the pressure of, of finances, having a mortgage or like there, you have to feed your kids and keep the electricity mm -hmm. on. And I am painfully aware of that part of needing the job and that fear. I, I understand that. Outside of that, I think we just get in our own way. Mm -hmm. And it is soul destroying. So I, I love that when you're coaching people, it's not just about what do you do or what do you want to do? Because that, that's all about work, right? Everything's mm -hmm. tied to who we are. And when people ask me that, what do you do? Well, I parent my kids. Well, I go running a lot. I, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I do a lot yeah, of things. I am many things, yeah outside of that and i think that that balance i understand why people want it we lose ourselves somewhere in this journey to find ourselves because mm. you're on that conveyor belt i think and, and so unfortunately exciting. even when we go on to our own business and we think we've i thought i'd made that one decision Ta-da! i've got a fulfilled life <laughs> right but it's not like that you have to keep making those pivots yeah. and choices and be brave and get out of your comfort zone and that's a, a lifelong thing which is incredible and it's exciting sometimes a bit exhausting but it is a never-ending discovery and adjusting and you know for a while I really valued freedom and getting away and being nomadic and then now I'm valuing a little bit more belonging and a bit more stability and so on so you kind of have to adapt your business adapt your life choices to how you're feeling and what's going on which is it is harder as you said than just staying in the same job in the same location with the same partner in the same house you know that's a lot easier so um that is you know the easy option i guess stay on the conveyor belt but i definitely think there's a lot of other things out there if we go out there and forge our own path you can even stay on the conveyor belt in your work and have balance in a lot of other areas that make you so much happier at your job i mean it's not a one and done there's no right answer for anyone you don't need to feel like you know a, a round hole in a square peg you you can it, you can do it in a lot of different ways and i love that part that it's not one and done you it's mm -hmm. constantly an evolution which is great because that means that we're we can constantly be changing and adapting that's an exciting beautiful thing it doesn't need to be scary mm -hmm. so what who are the people what's the biggest struggle for people in your coaching what where are they stuck the most and i know that changes sometimes because you're changing too but what what are the most the biggest aha moments or successes um oh, that's such a good question um i'm thinking that one is just this limiting ourselves always even after because again when they've come to me they've made the decision i mean this week next week i'm doing a facebook challenge for people who haven't made that decision yet so it's going to be all about you know okay people think okay i don't i can't afford to i don't have the time and so on and breaking down those barriers but by the time people come to me and are working with me they have broken down those they've chosen to invest in a coach they know they want to do this but even so i get and i i have people saying you know oh but shouldn't i um, have a more realistic dream because this just seems like too unrealistic, too ambitious. And I think again, constantly limiting ourselves and um, again, putting the how and getting caught up in the over analysis of how you're going to do and so on before you allow that dream to settle in. But is this something you want to do? Because I really think if there is something you want to do, you're really committed and motivated, you will find a way to make it happen. Um, an example and a personal example I give is, let's say I wanted to be a writer, right? So what does that mean? Does that mean I need to be JK Rowling? Will I ever be JK Rowling? I'm gonna say no. Okay, I'll <laughs> entertain it as a very theoretical possibility, but statistically speaking, probably not. Is that why I want to be a writer? No, I don't need to be a multi-million, billion, whatever she is now, um, you know, best-selling, et cetera, et cetera. What do I like about writing? I like expressing myself. I like connecting with people. I like people reading and feeling inspired and so on and so on. Okay, so how can I do that? Well, I can self-publish, right? I don't even have to now find a publisher. I can write my blog um, and so on. And suddenly within five years now from 
quitting to be a writer. <laughs> I now actually make a large sum of my money through writing, whether it's because I'm writing about sort of life choices and success and balance and so on. And that then brings people to the coaching or actually also write paid articles and I write trainings and so on. So somehow I've managed to achieve this dream, but it looks very, very different to maybe that ideal that you had on the shelf over there as some kind of wistful wishful thinking right so i think that's we're we're afraid of breaking apart that dream because suddenly then it becomes real and we have to work for it and it's going to be messy and all those things we said again so i think that's a big challenge and we even though we have taken that first step out of the comfort zone we have to keep taking those steps yeah and that's quite tricky yeah i wanted to be a published author and you talk about i talk, i yeah i'm gonna i should write a book you're right i should and when i lost my job you know, Dane looked at me and said, well, we can afford for you to take some time off. So why don't you write that book? And I, ha I thought, wow, now I have to decide, do I really want to write the book mm -hmm. or do I want to be the person that says that they want? And, and yes, I want to write that book, but what does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, so I wrote the book, but. Um, Amazing. Congratulations. Good thank you. But that, that whole process, it was, it was a, an entire process of emotion. Um, and I, I, glad that for me I had to st I was honest am I the person that just wants to talk about it mm. and never actually do it or do is it something that I'm really passionate about if you had taken that sailing class and you did it and you were like I'm really glad that I did that but it made me realize I'm not interested in it mm -hmm. isn't that just as great of an experience absolutely and for right. you too in that moment right you decided you know and actually now that I have the opportunity I'd rather spend that time building my business or working you know doing this volunteering being with my kids whatever that is right so as long as you're making that intentional choice and it probably requires you to have a go to try and yeah. by the way taking that step and taking action is the best thing to get you out of you know feeling stuck and and all those things that we're talking about as well so I think, are we afraid of being wrong and failing? Because oh I don't my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? no, 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 but, no, but I, I say that simply because yes, of course, but I mean, I say of course, but maybe it's not so obvious. I mean, years ago, I wouldn't have thought of this either. I wouldn't have said, oh, I'm not acting because I'm afraid of failing. I wouldn't even, it wouldn't have crossed my mind. Whereas yeah, fear of failure, fear of making the wrong choice. Um, fear of being told off, having to stand on your chair, right? Because yeah. you've chosen the wrong thing. It's easier to, cho to choose the the path that everyone is kind of expecting you to choose and to stay where you are stay in your lane as soon as you get out of that you open yourself up for criticism or laughter whatever it is and that is scary and um, one example a parallel that I had was um, I went to this presentation skills training back in my corporate time um, and it wasn't sort of basic this is how you do powerpoint bullets and so on it was really how to be an inspirational presenter and the guy gave some examples of how he had um, done something on consumer insights and and so on and he had dressed up as a safari guide he would made the room into like a jungle and he had animals and all sorts and so on and of course there were probably people saying what an idiot like you know why would he do this and it's so stupid but he made it completely memorable a lot of people I imagine loved it and everyone remembered the insights that he wanted them to remember whereas the easy choice would be and certainly the one I chose many times when I made presentations back in those days would just be to stick to the format yeah it'll be boring people probably won't learn anything, remember anything, but at least they won't, you know, it's better to not be remembered at all than to be remembered for standing out, which I think is a choice a lot of us make, even if it's subconsciously. Um, I don't know, I just found that quite an interesting parallel that you can go out there and be a bit crazy and fun and quirky, but the risk is, yeah, that, that people will then, because you're being seen, right? People will then be able to comment and that may not be so comfortable for you. To be honest, I found that 99 times out of 100, people are incredibly positive. The people who do take the time to reach out to you will be the ones who are engaging, who love what you do and so on, right? So that's been really the best part of this experience for me is chatting to people like you, having people comment on the blog and, and people finding me and so on. So, you know, once a year or something, I get some kind of sweary, <laughs> angry comment on a Facebook ad or email or something, you know, but it's, it's not actually, I'm happy to say it hasn't affected me in those particular comments. Maybe somebody will find something hurtful to say, I'm sure at some point, but hopefully I've built sort of my network and my confidence enough to you know for let them that. so to reassure people I guess that even if you do go out and become yourself and and the great thing now as well is um you know Facebook lives and all this authenticity and we're babbling on now obviously I haven't prepared this at all as we chat and that's so I nice love it. <laughs> hopefully that's the authentic and you know interesting yeah. experience that people want and actually that's much more 
an effective marketing strategy, they say, but much more real human experience. And people won't judge you, I think, as much as you think. They'll judge you more if you're putting up this veneer and trying to be all perfect when people know that that's not the case. I think be yourself. Again, come back to that core message. Yeah. 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 And because then people will authentically like you and you can't make everyone happy and that's okay. When you said that with your children, right, that uh, there will always be someone who doesn't like you so that they might as well not like you for who you actually are (laughs) rather than for some fake person you're trying to be. Right. So then at least um, you're being who you want to be. And probably that doesn't matter. Whoever that person is, it shouldn't really affect you because they're not important. It shouldn't because they're not important and they're not the one that you're trying to reach anyway. Mm. You want to reach the people you're making a difference to most of us are pretty altruistic in our ideals in what we're doing. Um, So yeah, if you're being authentic, then the people that want what you have to offer will be drawn to you. Mm -hmm. Anna, what piece in closing, what piece of advice would you give people who are considering making this change? I think to take a small step would be the general advice and in particular maybe to be super concrete if you're really not sure and if you just there's so much noise and you thinking oh but and the mortgage and this that and the other and all these worries and so on and, and you know I do like my job and is it really the right thing if you're getting caught up in that analysis paralysis try to take a step out as well so whether it's something like a bath or a run or a long walk and um, ideally a weekend away a few days away I think that's you know getting into nature for me it's getting to the ocean and um, just turning off some of that noise maybe sometimes it's the people around you as well you need some time just for you and often I think and this is counterintuitive for me having always been rational and logical and so on and information based and you will never have all the information to make this decision I can never tell you you can't tell somebody if it's right or wrong there is no right answer so the best way to make it is to feel and I think even though we are these rational western people deep down we do know that something is wrong um, and we want to change. And I think if you allow that voice to come out, um, then that is going to be the beginning of something wonderful for you. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your story and no more putting you on a chair. Oh, thank you. Now I'm actually <laughs> happy to be on a chair. That's the best now, thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, Put me on that chair. I will end up being on Facebook Lives. and play- no, it's not, I mean, it's not about performing, although I do love acting and so on as well. But no, I've, I've come to terms with a chair now. So. Good, good. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. I hope it was an interesting discussion. Thank you so much for listening in to Jen Taylor Rerouting. Like, share, and of course, comment. I welcome input with attitude. Get a copy of my book on Amazon. Hello, my name is Warrior Princess. Or check out my website, jentaylor.net. And if you still want more, sign up for one of my coaching packages. 